Hello, lovely internet strangers. In today's episode of the 8th Squares Corner, I am going to rant about an article I read about some research that's being conducted using a love simulation to essentially predict the outcome of people's relationships. Let's just get straight into this. So this is from a website called Inverse, which reports on a lot of sciency and geeky stuff, and they publish an article about some research going on at UC Santa Barbara, where they are uploading personalities and relationship decisions into simulated characters and letting them play out those decisions in a virtual world. 40 to 50% of the time, the IRL couples end up as couples in the simulated world. This also means that 40 to 50% of the time, couples do not match back up. Exactly why is at the heart of assistant professor Daniel Conroy Beam's research in the future, this information could be used to help people build happier relationships, Conroy Beam told Inverse. We're gonna get into why I'm like, WTF, this is stupid, in just a bit. So this guy is the head of the Computational Mate Choice Lab at UC Santa Barbara, which is apparently a thing. And he analyzes what decisions and rules people use when choosing a romantic partner. And he has been studying this for seven years, but finally was able to publish the first of his findings in January, 2021. So the study includes two experiments where this guy and his team asked all the participants and their partners how they would describe their ideal long-term mate. These questions probed how intelligent one's ideal partner would be, how kind, their ideal age, their physical attractiveness, along with questions about religion and sociability. They were instructed to be honest about what they actually want in a partner. Their romantic partners, in turn, were asked to describe where their person ranked on those dimensions. This allowed the study team to make a report that's an accurate reflection of what that person is really like, Conroy Beam says. And then we can just create little simulated copies that have all of those preferences and all of those tricks for each person, he explains. The team found there was about a 50-50 chance a couple would rematch match in the simulated world. This is something Conroy Beam wants to examine further in long-term studies. But this research does provide some clues. The team also asked the participants about how their relationships were going. How in love are you? How committed? What we find is the couples that we predict accurately with these simulations just have happier relationships on every dimension compared to the couples that we're getting wrong, Conroy Beam says. So not only are we thinking we're sort of picking up on something about how people do choose their partners, that gives us some hope that this might be useful in the future helping recommend people happier relationships. Another potential next step is testing whether the simulation could match potential lovers, like a potential dating app. Our sort of preliminary plans for the next step after that is to push us even earlier and get people who are single and see, can we make prospective recommendations, he explains. If we have a sample of single people, who would be a good match for you? This app would likely engage a willing audience. A 2020 Pew Research Center report found 30% of US adults have used a dating app or a website and 12% said they have found a long-term relationship because of online dating. The report also states 23% of Americans have gone on a date because of online dating. Sarah Bartos, a 25-year-old from Volusia County, Florida, says that while she knew her current boyfriend from high school, it wasn't until they matched on Tinder two years ago when they started to date. Bartos says she could definitely see the appeal for letting a simulation like Conroy Beams do the work. When Bartos matched with her current boyfriend, she had been using Tinder and other dating apps for a couple of years at that point. She turned them off when she started to date a different boy she met on Tinder, but after they broke up, turned them back on. It's fun, but there's definitely definitely days where you just kind of turn off notifications for it because it's like speed dating with less speed, but still so many different people. However, answering a questionnaire about yourself and letting your simulated self do the groundwork before actually investing in a date could save time and effort, Bartos acknowledges. I think so many people would go for that. If I hadn't met my boyfriend, I might be one of those people that went for something like that, Bartos says. However, the idea of a simulation dating for you still reminds Bartos of a Black Mirror episode. She doesn't quite like the idea of an algorithm figuring out your exact match. She said she only met with her current boyfriend on Tinder because he was in the area and they previously knew each other, but they had completely different personalities. But for me, the differences are what makes our relationship special. So I feel like it could be really, really great for some people, but there might be a lot of missed connections, Barto says. The complexities of these relationships and those missed connections are what Conroy Beam is looking at in his research. One trend he does see in the simulated couples is the value of reciprocity. This means that everyone has a fixed amount of resources like time and energy. Time and energy are in turn divided among the potential options. Conroy Beam says that while you may spend attention on someone, they might not spend attention on you, and eventually you will find someone else. This point of reciprocity underlies the weeding out process for the simulated couples, and eventually is the reason why couples stay together in the simulation. It's not just about sort of going for the option that's most appealing to you, he explains. You also have to consider the feedback you're getting from the other person, which a lot of theories in psychology had expressed before, but no one had really managed to capture a specific computational model before. Comrade Beam says that while no one has approached him about developing this technology, he wouldn't be surprised about being 
being contacted after more studies are done with long-term data. In the meantime, lovers looking to test the water with a simulation will have to practice with the Sims. Okay, where do I start with this? So I was a psychology major, for those who don't know. I was also an English major, but I was a psychology major too. Double major over here. So it's crazy to me that people are out here doing research like this and acting like we don't actually already have a ton of research on mate selection and also what makes relationships last. So the article says that they ask people to describe their ideal partner in terms of things like how kind they are, their age, their physical attractiveness, religion, sociability, etc., and then ranking where their actual partner measured up to that. But those factors have very little to do with what makes a successful relationship, with what makes a relationship last. I'm not saying that they're not important, but assuming that all the relationships you're looking at are with someone who, at least at the beginning, they met their criteria as far as attractiveness, intelligence, kindness, etc., you'll still see a bunch of relationships that don't work out. For one, we know about attachment styles. So the idea that based on the way that your parents interact with you when you're very young, you develop a certain attachment style. What you want is a secure attachment style, which means that you are secure in the knowledge that the people you are close to love you. You don't worry when they go away for a bit or if they give time and attention to other people because you're confident and secure in yourself and in your relationships. I'm doing very broad strokes on this for the sake of time. And then you have the anxious attachment style, where you get people who are essentially super clingy, they have a huge fear of abandonment, and then you have the avoidant attachment style, just like it sounds, they avoid intimacy and close relationships with other people. And then you have the fearful avoidant attachment style, which is basically a combination of the anxious and the avoidant, where you really, really, really want close relationships, and you can get like really close to people, but then as soon as you actually build that intimacy, you freak out and try to push the other person away because you essentially don't trust that it's not all going to go to shit, etc. There can be a lot of conflicting emotions there anyway. So you can often see people get into bad relationships where you have someone who has an anxious attachment style and they get with someone who has an avoidant attachment style. So the anxiously attached person is going to approach, approach, approach and want more and more intimacy. And they're going to perceive even minor moves away as a huge rejection and abandonment, which is going to be heightened if they're in a relationship with someone who has an avoidant attachment style who is going to make a point to create as much emotional distance between them as possible. So attachment style is one factor. Also, if you've never heard of the Gottmans, you should. They're a huge name in the field of relationship research. And they did all this research where they would bring couples into their lab and they were basically able to figure out what separated the couples who stayed together from the ones who eventually separated or got divorced. One of the things that they describe is bids for attention. This applies not just in romantic relationships, it also applies in friendships. And I could do a whole other video on how it applies in friendships, but basically bids for attention are pretty much what it sounds like. Anytime that you try to connect with your partner, this could be as simple as you're reading the newspaper and your partner is nearby in the kitchen doing something and you call out to them, hey, blah, 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 here's this thing I'm reading in the newspaper. And what you want is for them to acknowledge you in some way, in a positive way, like, oh, that's so interesting, or tell me more, or huh, I never knew that. Nothing crazy, but that's kind of what you want to happen. So they could respond that way. If your partner responds in this way positively, that is turning toward your bid for attention or bid for connection is another way to put it. The other option would be for them to turn away, which could just be as simple as they miss it and that's why they didn't respond. Basically, they ignore you, whether intentionally or not. And then there's turning against. So instead of responding positively to what you said or just missing what you said, they will have a negative response. Like, why are you always trying to talk to me when I'm doing the dishes? Can't you see I'm busy? Something like that. So bids for connection can be all kinds of things. It can be asking your partner partner to tell you about their day. It can be asking them to watch a TV show with you or take a walk with you, or it can be asking them for help figuring something out. It can be asking them to do you a favor, you know, run some errand for you that you would normally run. It can be asking them to learn a new skill with you or start a new diet with you or a new exercise program. And obviously it can manifest in the physical space, asking them to have sex or how do they respond when you go 
go in and kiss them on the cheek randomly. So the Gottmans found that for the couples that stayed together, the ones that they saw in their lab, those couples would turn towards each other in response to these bids for connection about 86% of the time. Whereas the ones that didn't, did it only about 33% of the time. And the Gottmans came up with what they call the four horsemen, which is the four things that signal divorce, basically. So you have criticism. So this is when you'll often say things like, you always do this or you never do this, which is going to make your partner feel defensive and like you're attacking them. It's not that you can't complain about the way that your partner is behaving, but you need to make it about the specific thing that they're doing and not a global attack on their personality. And then there's defensiveness. So if you defend yourself against a perceived attack with your own counter complaint, then you're being defensive. So even if your partner is criticizing you, you don't want to react defensively. That's going to lead you into a bad loop. Personally, I think the most important of the four horsemen is contempt. So contempt is any statement or nonverbal behavior that puts yourself on higher ground than your partner. So mocking your partner, calling them names, rolling your eyes, sneering in disgust. Those are all examples of contempt. These kinds of interactions will destroy the affection that you have for one another. It will erode respect. It's really bad. The other horseman is stonewalling. So that's when one person withdraws from the conversation, either physically leaving or they just obviously are checked out of the conversation. And sometimes the other person assumes that they don't care when really it's probably just they're feeling overwhelmed by all the conflict that's been going on. So my point is you can make some kind of algorithm that will help people find someone who's as smart as what they're looking for or as kind as what they're looking for, et cetera, et cetera. But that will only work to match them initially and help them build that initial attraction. As far as what gives couples staying power, you really have to look at the emotional health and emotional landscape of the people involved. Because from everything that I've seen anecdotally, from all the research that I've poured through, you can have people with very different personalities make a long-term relationship work if they both have secure attachment styles, if they turn toward each other in the bids for attention and they avoid things like expressing contempt toward each other. Other things that we know about what makes relationships last, like when we're talking about life partner relationships and not just dating relationships, is do you agree on the really important things like not just about having kids, but how to raise your kids. Do you agree about how to spend your money? Because even say that both partners make a decent amount of money and could kind of like support themselves. If you have very different philosophies around money, one person might be resentful of the way the other person spends their money because being in a life partner relationship with someone is different than being someone's friend. They become like a part of you and you want to respect them totally. So anything that could make you lose your respect for that person is going to kill your relationship long term. Anything that could lead you into arguments over the long term, those are going to be real relationship killers. People who have very different ideas about what's a good way to spend their time or where they want to live. Like one person wants to live in the city and always be active and having cultural experiences and one person really wants to live in the middle of nowhere and raise some farm animals. Those people may be attracted to each other and love each other but they're not going to make it as life partners, most likely. They might, but it'll probably be a relationship that is not very pleasant over the long term for either of them. A lot of resentment will build up, and if they don't leave, it's just because they're too stubborn to do so, and they'd rather just stay in that relationship and make the other person suffer emotionally or whatever. And that's only a small fraction of what we know about relationships and why they work and why they don't. But the other thing that is missing here, which we also have research on, is the biological factor such as the research that has been done that has shown differences in mate selection by women who are taking hormonal birth control and those who aren't. And this doesn't happen to everyone, but experiences from women who got with their partner while on birth control and then went off of it and ended up leaving that partner because they no longer experience attraction for them in the same way. Again, that's not universal, but it does happen. And we do have some research, it's been a while since I've looked at it, about women smelling the sweaty t-shirts of 
of different men and how that correlated to the ones that were essentially a genetically fit match. And there are all kinds of stories that you'll hear from people who matched with someone who was great on paper, but there was just something that didn't quite click. So you can ask people who their ideal match is on paper, give it to them, and there'll still be something that's just not quite right. Whether that's because the pheromones are off, whether that's because people aren't really that good at knowing what will actually turn them on. Not to mention the fact that if the matches are being made based on the way people describe themselves versus the way they actually are, then you're going to get pretty mixed results because as someone who was a psychology student, I can tell you how unreliable self-report is and yet we continue to use it all the fucking time. Anyway, so I just kind of want to talk about this because I really like talking about psychology and relationship psychology and it kind of relates to things that I talk about on this channel as far as dating and men and women and I kind of wanted to just like expand the scope of what I talk about a little bit and also bring up something I like to talk about a lot which is stupid research or research that doesn't make any sense and why you shouldn't just respect someone or trust someone because they're a scientist and here's some research. And I'll cap this off by just throwing in my own two cents of wisdom after being with the same person for seven years, married for two, which is that there are plenty of people I've connected with. There are other people I've had serious relationships with before this one. And there are other people that I have connected with while being in this relationship. Because as I've mentioned, I've done the poly thing over the years. So I can tell you that there are plenty of people that you can connect with, or at least that's been my experience, in very different ways and you could have very different relationship dynamics with all of them. So at the end of the day, what actually makes things work is being mindful as you go through each relationship and asking yourself, why did you leave that relationship? Or maybe why did that person leave you? What was it about you that didn't fulfill them? Or what was it about them that didn't fulfill you? And making note of those things. Like something that I learned in the past was I had a partner who really wanted someone he could rely on for a kind of emotional support that I found to be acting as an emotional crutch but maybe wouldn't be perceived that way by somebody else. So it just was never going to work because he had an emotional need that I couldn't fulfill. So then I kind of set aside people like that and my current partner is a lot more emotionally independent. So noting things like that, that you learn over the course of relationships, but also once you do find someone who is basically suitable, I always say find someone who's flaws you can live with, that's important. It's just about loving them in terms of a verb, not an emotion. It doesn't matter how you feel about them, how much you love them in your heart, if they don't know it through your actions. And I've learned that the hard way over the years. So even on those days where you're really tired and you just don't care about anything, still finding the ways to show them that you care. Even on the days where you roll over and you're like, I can't believe I'm still looking at the same face seven years later, oh my god or whatever you don't jump ship that you reach out to connect with them you make these bids for connection and they respond appropriately and when they make their bids for connection you make it a priority to turn toward them definitely not against and try not to turn away you know or if you realize you've been turning away lately that you've been distracted that you've been saying you're too tired or you're busy or whatever that you make it a priority to change that to start turning toward them again. Maybe that has to change over time because especially when people have kids, things will shift in terms of the energy levels they have available and the things that you can do together, your time to have shared activities and pick up some new hobby together or whatever, but you find a way to continue to connect. And as you get on in the relationship, it's not that you stop being attracted to each other, it's just that the attraction factor, the sexual factor, even the romantic factor just becomes less important than having someone that becomes your family. And in the good sense, in the chosen family sense, someone that you can rely on, someone that you can trust, be yourself with, drop all of your armor and your masks, someone that you know is going to tell you the truth, even if it isn't what you want to hear, but someone who knows you enough 
to approach you at the right times and to tell it to you in a way that you'll understand and who cares enough to keep working with you on communication issues or any other issues that pop up. One thing that made me feel super comfortable with my husband is that anytime we'd get in some kind of conflict, he would always say, we'll figure it out. Whatever happens, we would come to some kind of resolution, some kind of solution. And we always have. Sometimes that resolution is just accepting that the two of you are very different in some capacity and making your peace with that. It doesn't always mean both parties feel full of sunshine and rainbows about that particular thing, you know? So I think this whole approach to finding relationships where like we're gonna build an algorithm is just never gonna work. I met my husband online, but it was just convenient to be able to have access to a pool of men that were not people that I worked with because I tried that and I didn't want to be mixing my dating pool with my professional pool anymore. And it was just helpful to be able to filter people in a certain age range that I was comfortable with, people in a certain geographic location, obviously, and I could read their profile and get a sense somewhat of the kind of person that they were. It just helps you filter down the potential pool. But there are plenty of people that seemed great when I looked at their profile online, but then when we met up, it was like, no. But with my husband, it was a yes. But I don't think there's an algorithm that could have matched us because there are a lot of ways in which we are different. And honestly, I don't know if we had mutual friends before we met, if they would have thought to match us up. I don't know because they might have been like, oh, he's like this. She tends to be like this. And I could see that not working, whatever. But sometimes there's just like that je ne sais quoi that you can only identify after actually meeting the person and interacting with them. And it makes you want to overcome any incompatibilities that you have so that you can, you know, hang out with this person until you die. Anyway, I know it's hard out there for those of you that are still single and still believe in marriage and life partners and want to find that person to hang out with until you die. So... I can't really recommend online dating anymore because I was on it in 2014 and let's be real, the world was entirely different then and I will make a video at some point about online dating, OkCupid especially, and how that has changed over the past several years. It might still work for those of you who are somewhat introverted, but for the rest of you, I would just say try to meet people in real life, hit up your friends, see who they know, don't be afraid to talk to people in real life. I read a lot of red pill blogs and and they're always talking about how like, yeah, you get this message from the media and society that like women are gonna mace you if you try to talk to them in public, but like, it's not true, not generally. I mean, if you're trying to talk to her at like 2 a.m. in an empty subway station, then yeah, you might get maced. But if you just approach a chick at a cafe, whatever, you're gonna get rejected a lot, but you could definitely meet someone that way. I also hear a lot of Twitter love stories, you know, like connecting through the internet, but not through online dating portals specifically through different online communities where, you know, you have something in common. So like the equivalent of going out and doing your hobby in person, it's just an online community. Anyway, I welcome all your thoughts on relationships and marriage and dating and algorithms and research. Give me all the comments. I read them all, even though I don't respond to every single one. I try to. Sometimes it takes me a really long time. You might get a comment back like months later. I'm sorry. I have a high volume of both YouTube related correspondence and personal correspondence and, you know, other life projects, but I try. And oftentimes, even if I don't respond, I make note of the things that you guys say for future videos. So thank you for watching. If you liked this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe and I will have more content for you very soon.